Okay, so let us look at a couple of examples, right, and sort of see if we can dive a bit deeper into them. One is audio processing, okay. So, I am basically going to consider input audio that has been sampled at 48 kilo samples per second and I will say that this is basically 16 bit data, okay. And the operation that we are trying to do is filter it, okay, and I am assuming it is a 30 tap filter. So, what does this actually mean? It basically says something like this, my input data if I look at this as the time axis can be thought of as a set of samples. right. So, this could be thought of as my x of n. I have some kind of a filter. This would be the typical structure of a let us say a low pass filter used in order to eliminate some frequency components, right. I am drawing it this way because typically low pass filters tend to be symmetric, etc., etc. Those are not properties we are particularly concerned with here. All that we care about is we have some coefficients, okay. And the operation that we are trying to perform is essentially this. For k is equal to some 0 up to n minus 1, where n is the number of taps, okay. So, this is it. This is the operation that we are trying to perform. We take data, multiply it with a set of coefficients add everything together and generate one output result, okay. One possible architecture for this looks roughly like this. It basically says I have my input x of n coming here. I will put it through some kind of a delaying element, okay. This is typically a register with a clock. So, I have a set of registers like this, okay. Now, I need to take x of n and multiply it with in this case if I look at what would be the coefficient corresponding to x of n that would be h of 0, okay, because k equal to 0 gives h of 0 into x of n, okay. So, I can basically say this would be h of 0. This point over here would essentially be x of n minus 1, right and this is something that is important to keep in mind this block that I have drawn over here and marked it as this register, right. The way that we normally think about it is, it is simply a flip flop or a set of flip flops connected with a clock and at every clock cycle the data passes through that flip flop from input to output. Yes, this is a valid way of thinking about it, but as far as we are concerned, we are going to generalize that a bit further. I do not really care whether it is one particular flip flop with a clock attached to it. All that I really care about is whatever I see at the output of this register is the sample that was present one sample interval previously, okay. So, I am going to distinguish between sample interval and clock interval, okay. The reason I am making this distinction will be clear later when we go a bit deeper into these implementations. What I want you to sort of just keep in mind for the time being is the sample interval is something which is a true property of the system itself. So, for the case of audio when I said 48 kilo samples per second that 48 kilo samples per second is my sample rate, okay. I will get 48,000 samples of data. Does that mean that the clock which is used for my system is exactly 48 kilohertz? Not necessary. I could work at a 1 megahertz clock, a 100 megahertz clock, anything I want. As long as that 1 megahertz system basically wakes up 48,000 times per second, takes some data and copies it to another place. It will still process the data at the correct rate, although its internal clock is different from the sample rate, okay. So, once we view it that way, it becomes clear that this register that I have drawn over here is no longer necessarily a flip flop. It could be, but that is only one spe special case. In general, it is just something that is used in order to store the previous sample, okay. And the understanding that we associate with these registers is simply that every time I pass across a register, at the output side I have one sample older than what was there on the input side. 
okay with that in mind i can basically say okay now this needs to be multiplied by h1 this needs to be multiplied by h2 h3 and so on and then add it until I get y of n, okay. So, it sort of becomes clear from this that what is ultimately going to happen, right. If I say that I want to have a 30 tap filter, at 48 kilo samples per second, right, will basically involve 30 multiplication operations, 29 additions, I am just going to call it 30 additions, right, it that 1 over here does not really make any difference. So, roughly, you know, it is equal to the number of, uh, it is close enough to the number of uh, multiplications that I will just keep the same value in both cases, right. So, these are the two main operations, but there is also depending on how I have implemented it, these x of n values could either be just sitting in registers or they might need to explicitly be read from a register and copied into a local variable somewhere inside my processor and then operated upon. If I need to do that, then basically the way that I have to think about it is, now this involves reading and writing memory, okay. Which means that 30 x values to be read and 30 h values also to be read. Okay. Now, depending on your architecture, you might be able to create something where the h values do not need to keep on coming from memory, they might actually physically sit next to your multiplier. But that is possible only if you have a separate hardware multiplier for each coefficient, right. If you are doing it with a programmable processor, that is not going to happen, which means that for every input sample, I now need to read every single coefficient, even though they are not changing, I need to read it again from memory. Okay. The x values again need to be read from memory. If you look closely, you might also think, okay, do not I need to also perform the shift operation that also requires some reading as well as writing the x values. There are some tricks you can do over there to minimize the amount of reading and writing that you need to do. So, we will ignore that for the time being. Basically, you can use circular buffers or something like that to prevent going on reading and writing the x values. Okay. So, what this means is with this in place, we can compute a few data points, right. Going back to our questions over here, estimate the bit rate. The raw bit rate coming in from the sampling is essentially something like 48,000 samples per second into what we assumed was 16 bits per sample. Which is basically what that comes down to is 16 into 48 is roughly around 800,000 800, bits per second, okay. Now, I want all of you to try and get into the habit of making approximate computations like this, right. The number I have written here 800,000 is not accurate and it should be obvious that it is not accurate, right. Where did I get that number from? I wanted to multiply 16 into 48,000, but to me it is a bit easier to multiply 16 into 50,000 because 16 into 5 I know what the result is, it is 80, okay. So then if I do 16 into 50,000, it turns out that I can get a better estimate 800,000 bits per second faster than if I try to do 16 into 48, okay. If you can do 16 into 48 fast, that is perfectly fine, just go ahead with the exact numbers, but do not keep pulling out a calculator for these kind of computations, 
that's not the point of what we are trying to do over here because at the end of the day I really don't care whether this is 800 kilobits per second or 750 kilobits per second. All I care is it's not 10 megabits per second, okay. All right, so that gives us an idea of at what rate we are getting data in from the outside world, okay. Why is this useful? May not be useful, it depends. It helps you to design your architecture. You have to have some part of the architecture that can handle this bit rate coming in from the A to D converter. All right, the number of multiply accumulates per second. So once again, for every sample that comes in, I need to perform the entire filtering operation, okay, which basically means that 48,000 times per second, I need to do 30 multiplies and adds. I am going to call that a multiply accumulate operation. So once again, I have 48,000 into in this case 30, which gives me basically around 750. In this case one and a half million, right. Yeah, so 48 into 3, roughly 50 into 3, 150, right. So you get around one and a half million multiply accumulates per second, okay. And what about the memory bandwidth? we see over here the number of data that need to be read right and from there we basically come up with 48,000 times per second. I will need to read 60 words right where a word could be 8 bits, 16 bits, 32 bits depending on the number of bits that you are using in order to store your data. Of course, x is in this case 16 bits, I have already given you that. The h values we do not know, they could be 8 bits, 16 bits, 32 bits depending on the number format that you have chosen. But I am going to leave that aside and say it is just a memory read, right. In which case it basically gives us this number that this is going to be 3 million reads per second right and 3 million reads per second assuming 16 bits is basically going to be 6 million bytes per second or 6 megabytes per second that needs to be read okay. So all that we have done is a very high level computation that just basically tells us okay look this is the number of data points that I need to read and therefore this is approximately the amount of data that I will need to fetch from memory in order to do my computation in real time. 